All right, so I'm a little intimidated to be in this room because I'm not an eDNA scientist and many of the people who are, I'm only one, I'm the spokesperson for this project and those listed on the slide are um, the co-chairs of in the DIY leadership team. But there's also a lot of scientists working on this project and many of them are in this room. So when you guys, either I say something wrong, you're welcome to come up here and tackle me or you can um, speak up and tell me what I'm doing wrong. So as um, evidence on this slide, I'm the only one that's not in a DOI bureau and I want to start off this talk by talking about my organization, the National Invasive Species Council, and then get into a little bit about invasive species so we're all talking the same language and then eDNA and the National ED, um, Early Detection and Rapid Response or EDRR framework. So NISC, the National Invasive Species Council was formed in 1999 under the Clinton administration and its goal in those early years was just to raise awareness about invasive species issues across the federal family. Um, in 2016, President Obama signed Executive Order 13751, which moved from just raising awareness to implementation of, um, and coordination of invasive species efforts across the federal family. So we are organized, we are, the NISC is, has 12 executive branch departments and four White House offices that range from a lot of different things that people traditionally don't think of as working in the invasive species sphere. Um, but it's perfectly positioned to help operationalize a early detection and rapid response framework for invasive species. So I'm used to standing in front of groups of invasive species biologists and not in front of y'all. So I just want to make sure we're all talking the same language and just define invasive species. So this comes from the executive order that I already mentioned under the Obama administration. And the key points of this um, definition of an invasive species are that they're not native to the ecosystem where they're being found and that they cause some kind of harm. This definition is really broad to encompass all the different work that the NIST member agencies do from Department of Transportation, Health and Human Services, and so on. So why are we building a national early detection and rapid response framework? Why is this important? Um, so moving from the common definition of an invasive species, it's time to, it's important to know what, why invasive species are important. Last year, September timeframe, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPSBEST, released a global, first global assessment of invasive species and estimated that the annual cost of invasive species are $423 billion. And this is probably still an underestimate of both the economic as well as the ecological cost of invasive species. Again, this is a slide that invasive species biologists use all the time, but you might not be familiar with it, but this is a um, invasive species spread and management model with time in the stages of the invasive process um, on the x-axis and control cost, area invested and harm to the environment, economy and human health on the y-axis. So as you move left to right on the x-axis, you management cost and harm to the environment increase. So if we take a reactive approach and always are just responding to invasive species um, spread in the environment, you're going to be dealing with a lot of harm and a lot of cost. So the most effective way to deal with this is to look in those early stages of the environment of the invasion and either prevent those invasions in the first place or um, work in that what we call EDRR, early de detection and rapid response area of the invasion curve. And that's why the framework that I'm going to discuss for the rest of this talk is focusing on that EDR spot where we can have the most effective management at uh, the least cost effect, uh, most cost effective. I keep looking over there and seeing my face staring back at me and it's a little bit disturbing, <laughs> a little bit disturbing. So moving on, I just put it all out there and let you know how I'm feeling. Um, this early detection and rapid response framework is based on a lot of um, publications from a lot of different agencies as, as well as publications in scientific literature. One of those, the one, um, I, yeah, it's the one that looks like a triangle, is a NIST publication that was done in 2016 talking about and calling for an early detection or app response framework, um, as well as there was a special issue of biological invasions in 2012 that called for a, a national early detection and rapid response framework. Both of these publications from 2016 and 2020 really conceptualized this framework, and you're like, but it's 2024, what's happened in interim, and why are we talking about this framework now? And the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed um, in 2022, and this has laid, has given the resources to actually go from just conceptualizing this framework to actually operationalizing it and implementing it. 
So DOI made the strategic decision to use bill funding to um, try to advance this early detection rapid response framework. It's a wagon wheel is what I like to call this diagram. It's a very, this is um, from these publications, the 2020 Biological Invasions um, Special Issue that um, looks at an early detection rapid response framework from looking for these invasive species offshore so you know what to look for um, as well as detecting them, um, responding to them, and so forth. And the, the key parts of this um, early detection rapid response mission, this is a working mission statement, is uh, using coordination and innovative approaches to detection and response. So you might be asking why I'm here at an eDNA workshop. I'm asking myself the same question, talking about this framework. And the answer to that is that focus on innovation. So um, I'm going to flip real quick to talk, even though um, Chris and others have already done this, but I want to talk about this connection between our framework, the early detection rapid response framework, and the um, aquatic eDNA. See, I used aquatic because that's what we're mostly doing here. Um, but the goal of the eDNA strategy is use the power of the eDNA to sustain and restore biological resources. And one way that this will be happening is, and is currently happening is by using eDNA to find invasive species early in that early detection and rapid response stage of the invasion curve. This is a very complex and messy slide. And I just wanted, it's that wagon wheel diagram again that is a conceptual framework for um, the EDR framework, but with all the projects that uh, the Department of Interior has invested it in, in the various categories of planning, detecting, reporting, and responding to invasive species. And I just wanted you to show that there's not just eDNA in this framework, it's a really diverse framework covering all gamuts of invasive species, but I just wanted to show you all the different projects before I go into the details. But first, I know I'm in goal three area, I'm supposed to just talk about goal three, but I feel that our framework actually touches all three goals. So the first goal of the strategy is this coordination. And the framework aligns perfectly, our EDR framework aligns perfectly with this goal because although DOI is taking a leadership role and provided bill investments in this framework, it is intended to be not just at DOI, but across the entire federal family and beyond the federal family to include um, state partners, tribal partners, county, city, states, anyone that's involved in invasive species management. Um, and coordination is the key, as you saw in the framework um, mission statement, is the key to um, the success of this framework. The goal too about um, adding capacity and infrastructure to employ EDA technology, and I already mentioned these historic bill investments allowed DOI to oper operationalize um, this framework. And this, um, a key part of this is really making big investments into early detection using eDNA as a basis of that early detection. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk being embarrassed to talk in front of the people who actually did this work, um, but about all the projects that we have invested in in um, eDNA as a part of this framework. And one of those, um, and I'm staring right at Cheryl, she's like right in front of me, um, is the work that Cheryl and her team are doing, uh, developing a genetic material repository network, and I didn't know that I'd have to take a shot when I was talking about a, um, this kind of thing, and I wasn't prepared, so I just brought water. But um, this is a key component, especially when you're looking for invasive species, you need to have a reference library of those priority invasive species. So Cheryl and her team are using the prioritized list of invasive species that we want to monitor and survey for, and using that to develop a material repository where um, she can get reference samples and build a library that then can be used by and I don't think anyone on this team is in this room, but um, the genetic marker development team. So we have a whole series of people working on developing markers so that these um, species can be looked for in the environment. And of course, you all know that that's the key to having, being able to actually do eDNA surveillance is having markers that can be used. So another cool thing that is happening is, and this is moving into our detect, from our plan to our detect part of the framework is surveillance tools that are being developed and the point of use tools that are being used. And um, you guys are way more familiar with this technology than I am, but they're, they're using LAMP and other um, technologies to allow for rapid on-site testing with minimal processing in uh, individuals that don't have to be super well trained in this. I mean, I could do it, so. Um, 
And these point of use tools are envisioned to be used at places where you're going onto public lands or places at the ports of entry. So I wanted to give you a quick example of how this um, point of use tool for eDNA has actually been used in a real world case. So a few years ago in 2021, a pet store employee discovered zebra mussels on aquarium moss balls that were being imported. And he alerted the USGS, and it started a really massive response across many federal agencies on how to deal with this. And we didn't realize that this was a pathway that zebra mussels were entering the United States and could be contaminating more waterways. And zebra mussels are a really bad invasive species. So um, the USGS worked on developing a tool that could be deployed at the port of entry where these zebra or these moss balls were being imported. Um, because the center picture shows you um, a zebra. Um, a moss ball with some zebra mussels on it, and some of them were even tinier in that and in stages where it's really hard to see with your eyes. So your eDNA was perfectly um, positioned to solve this problem. So this technology has actually been deployed at two ports of entry. So um, looking at being able to use a molecular technique to look for zebra mussels instead of just relying on visual inspection, which is what mostly happens at the port of entry. So yay eDNA, thank you. Um, also, Adam was already up here talking about another, uh, the ReadyNet project, which is going to allow us to take uh, samples of eDNA across time and as well as across a large spatial area. And I'm super excited about this. I might not be an eDNA expert, but this is going to allow us to ask really important questions and I think address some of the trust issues that have been already mentioned about um, when you have a snapshot, it's hard to interpret that, but if you get this up across the spatial and time scale, it's a uh, better able to assure those of the re results of your sampling. And if you have questions, Adam's in the room and he would love to talk about ReadyNet. So in his ReadyNet, it's gonna produce lots and lots of samples. So with that, we needed to develop a molecular lab network or a place to process all those samples in the field. Um, and so we're, the framework is investing in this molecular lab network and we actually hope to expand this past just like DOI labs but to other federal labs that might be processing these samples. Currently the network is consistent of four labs across the continental United States and Alaska and some of those labs are focused on processing samples but there's also a lab that's dedicated to science support. So when we have a state partner that's gonna come in and wants to develop an eDNA strategy, um, sampling surveillance strategy, they can go to that lab and help get support to do that because a lot of you know, state agencies and local agencies don't have that kind of expertise on staff. So I think it's gonna be really great. And they're working on standardized protocols across all these labs. So now this is what I was supposed to talk about, right? With goal three. Um, and so the third goal of this strategy is coordinated eDNA observations. And I think the framework is really getting at this. And part of this is driven by those trust issues that we talked about. It's like, how can we great, um, get individuals more accustomed to eDNA and see the value of it and be using it more effectively for addressing invasive species? So to that end, one of the projects we've invested in is this resource manager's eDNA toolbox. And we envision this as sort of a one-stop shop for eDNA um, information so that if a like a land manager is considering a surveillance, they were worried about an invasive species, they can go to this um, site and see if Cheryl has genetic material, if the marker team has made a marker, if there's the different things available so that, and, and, and basic, ask the basic question, is eDNA um, right for the question that they wanna ask about invasive species? And to Adam's point earlier, there's a strong focus on communication. So there's templates for communication strategies in, the, in this web, um, toolbox as well. Um, and best practices. So I think it's gonna hopefully help connect individuals that are interested in eDNA with the right resources and ask some questions if they would be, um, if it'd be the right tool for them. Lastly, I just wanted to admit this last component of the framework I wanted to mention is this SIREN and it's our information system. It's like the central hub of that wagon wheel diagram I put up before and it, it's gonna be a place where Invasive species by, um, practitioners can go and find connection to a lot of these projects I already mentioned. So hopefully it'll be a way that they can, again, overcome some of those barriers to implementing um, eDNA in the ground. And I just wanna say that we are moving from development, the first early years of the framework, we're developing a lot of the tools, and we're moving this summer into actually getting some of these framework tools on the ground. And we are looking at a series of pilot projects over the course of the next few years. Um, and the first one is in the Southeast um, United States. I didn't talk about all the projects that led to, the, the, um, to this project, but it's 
was using hotspot analysis to figure out where these hotspots of invasion were, and then looking with, we're working with all the states in this area to develop um, surveillance in uh, strategies for invasive species that were prioritized by the um, local agencies. Right now, we're there. There's. It, it was actually surprised that some of these states are actually really want to do eDNA. So we're look. It might not be this first summer that eDNA is deployed, but hopefully in the next few years, we'll actually get eDNA as part of this um, of our first project pilot project in the southeast or one of the future pilots. So definitely moving from um, into implementation. I thought Chris was picking up something. Was like gonna be, he was going to say, get off the stage, but he was just folding his notebook. We're all okay. We're working through it. Um, so to bring this to a close, um, and I should do comedy apparently on the side or something. I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to go back to the connections between the strategy and the EDR framework. So the strategy aims to sustain and restore biological resources, and part of that's being achieved through our national EDR framework, a focus on coordination across federal, state, and tribal organizations, as well as other entities that are engaged in invasive species. And we're employing additional eDNA capacity to do that, to find and eradicate invasive species before they can cause lasting harm to our biological resources. And in support of Maggie, the last picture is a python. If you have any questions. Thank you, Angela. Um, we do have some time for questions, but uh, as uh, one of the co-chairs for the conference, the, the workshop today, I would like to use my authority to christen you an environmental DNA scientist. Yes! <laughs> my goal in life has been achieved. I just uh, like to use your great science to, and I mean, it's so impressive. Like you, I mean, I was used to work at USDA for a long time, and using molecular methods to answer questions is just awesome. So I appreciate your science, even if I'm not in the lab doing it with you. Beautiful. So. Um, I did have one question on standards that are being used. How, uh, within the organizations within EDRR, are you supporting the, the maintenance of the standards, like the, the genetic references, or the genetic markers and things like that, the physical specimens? And is this something that has an opportunity for uh, non-governmental groups to be involved in, in maintaining these in some way? Or is this something that you see staying there? So I think there's several like people in this room that have been working on standards. There's Maggie, who worked on standards for including, there's a non-indigenous aquatic species database, NAS database, and she's been instrumental in working on standards for what kind of eDNA information is included in that database. And that's just to ensure like, that all the data that in there is, can be used. And she, she's standing right there at the, below my picture. Oh yeah, oh she's got a mic, answer the question. <laughs> oh, your mic's uh, not on, sweetie. Green, Mitch, Mike. Got it. We used community consensus to develop those standards. So we went, um, used a core group, and then we went all the way out through people who use eDNA into managers and task force to really try to gather feedback from around the community. Um, and these are really living documents, so I think we'll continue to assess that as the technology develops. And then for Cheryl's pro projects and others, we're getting those launched off the ground. Um, and there are a lot of uh, different groups being reached out to to make sure that we're gathering feedback across the community to ensure those there are standards being used that are accepted. And we have, like, for each project, there's a, um, a working group or different ways that we have a social scientist, which is amazing, especially considering the trust issues and some of the um, adoption issues. So we have a social scientists that has helped work with community engagement so that it's not just other feds working on this, but it's um, all the community that would be using these tools. And Cheryl wants to say something, Maggie. Uh, Kevin has a microphone too, potentially. Could we get one over Cheryl? See, how would you feel? She was on the writing team and she was on the writing team and I'm up here representing their work, not right, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, um, so for the genetics material repository, um, we're working to try to make sure that there are vouchered specimens that are the basis for, for all of these um, species that we're working to make assays for. So we're partnering with the Smithsonian and, and others, and that's a really important part of this. And um, the social scientist is definitely helping us to build this, all of the infrastructure, all of the components from the ground up together, so co-production, which is really amazing. Great. 
So with regard to physical specimens, this means that if there is a need for a genetic reference itself, not the data that goes along with it, but the physical specimen, people in this room can email yourself or others at USGS to get access to these? How are, how are these? Eventually. Um, so, we, like Angela said, this is a, a work in process. We're, right. we're developing this, and um, we're going to start off um, within our EDR, our network yeah. sharing, um, but the plan is to eventually share with the broader community. This sounds like a fantastic topic for implementation uh, breakout sessions. Looking forward to that. Any other questions within the room? Go ahead. i pass the mic over. Uh, thank you. This is a more... Uh, two-in-one ecological question for you, uh, based on your background, I think. Uh, so what, what happened when you have not an introduction, like accidental introduction in, in disturbed environments, but when you have a, like a permanent change in the environmental conditions where uh, an invasive species or a non-native species will, will, will certainly come more one, than one time or try to uh, like uh, settle in in a uh, in condition uh, um, uh, like after an environmental change, and the second one, what happens if you have a, an invasive species uh, that is can be harmful to other native species but has great economical value? I'll just say for the second question, I think it's over 50% of the species listed on the threatened and endangered species list are there because of some impact of an invasive species. So there's a direct link between you know, T&E species and invasive species. The, when you, your first question about environmental change, climate change is like a huge thing, right? Ranges are shifting naturally because of, or not naturally human assisted shifts because of climate change. And there's, um, Someone is going to resist, accept, or direct. There's like a RAD framework that's being developed of like how to deal with climate change and whether to resist it and try to maintain conditions or, um, you know, guide succession to a new, you know, to a new steady state uh, with climate change. And there's also a lot of um, talk in a, one of my colleagues at NISC is working on managed relocation, like moving species because of climate change and what are the risks of that. So it's a hot topic of, there's a huge intersection between climate change and invasive species in new areas of the United States. We used to think Florida, Maggie, thank you, had all the invasive species and it would just stay there, but now with climate change, those um, subtropical and tropical climates are gonna move further north in, in the US and, and allow those invasive species to have damage elsewhere. So, can I escape yet? Thank you so much. Thank you.